So okay, got it. So it's, everything's working. Good. Everything's working. So good to have you finally, Professor Kellner. No, uh, remember, seven years back, I wrote to you about a physical visit to our country. Uh, right. That time around couldn't happen, but we're so happy that uh, we have this new opportunity. Thanks to Zoom, thanks to technology that you are here. And uh, a lot of our students are really looking forward to this. And uh, I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this very special day, very special occasion in the history of the Department of Cultural Studies at Tejpur University, uh, when we have a rare opportunity to interact with Professor Douglas Kellner. For students of media and cultural studies across the world, uh, Professor Kellner needs no introduction, and um, we are all familiar with the works and the philosophy of Professor Kellner. So I'll not go into a long introduction of his works, and uh, thereby lose valuable time because um, you know we are all here to listen to you, Professor Kellner. And uh, that, however, there are a few quick things that uh, I would like to mention. When one reads Professor Kellner's works one comes across an ethical and a moral intent behind his research. And this is what I believe connects the wide variety of work that he has written over the years. And uh, in an age when research has tended to be only about research, unfortunately, uh, Professor Kellner has been one of those, uh, um, you know, researchers, one of those uh, who we have really looked up to as um, you know, doing academic work that has a moral intent. And um, so, for instance, when he writes about critical um, media literacy, he speaks from a position of ideological conviction that um, you know, there's a need to strengthen democratic values in society, to make people aware of what is happening in media and to resist even a vicious cultural environment. So, when he writes about critical media literacy, he, uh, he, he, he talks about techno literacies, for instance. And, um, you know, so he talks about developing the need to develop counter hegemonic skills uh, in the interest of advancing the interest of uh, democratization. And uh, therefore, let me not take any more time and uh, we we'll look forward to listen to Professor Kellner now. Professor Kellner, you can please uh, start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for that uh, very nice uh, introduction. Much appreciated. And good evening, uh, India. It's a uh, little after 8 p.m. in L.A. And rather than go to a movie or a play that we often do in Los Angeles, today I am in India talking to you on a Saturday night. And I guess, are you on Sunday morning? Uh, you, or Saturday, Sunday morning, and Sunday I guess morning. you're starting your uh, early morning uh, listening to Los Angeles. So this is the new global uh, world that Marshall McLuhan uh, described, who I'll uh, refer to in a few uh, minutes. Uh, tonight, as you know, I'm going to speak about cultural studies as both a global and a national project. And I'm going to proceed through outlining some stages of media theory and cultural studies from the 1960s uh, when I started immersing myself in media culture and to think about the uh, media up to the uh, present time. So this is gonna be a historical and genealogical talks of stages of the road to uh, uh, cultural uh, studies. Um, I'll show how um, cultural studies has gone global, but it also has very important national uh, versions uh, ranging from British cultural studies to my work and others in North American cultural studies to the proliferation of cultural studies throughout the world. And we'll be interested in the discussion to hear your views on whether or not there is a Indian uh, cultural uh, studies. Um, I'll argue that every country should develop its own cultural studies 
but it should be a national project that draws on what is now a global cultural studies. So I'm going to present a genealogy of media theory and the emergence of cultural studies in the US as I experienced it from the 1960s to present. So this is gonna be from my experience and my point of view. Other people will have different genealogies of cultural studies and different stages of uh, arriving at the uh, point of appropriating British cultural studies. So for me, my generation in the 1960s in the US was strongly influenced by Marshall McLuhan's understanding media. It came out in 1964 that argued that book culture is being replaced by media culture. And therefore it is necessary to understand media, the title of McLuhan's book, in order to understand contemporary culture and uh, society. And it's important to be media literate to learn how to read the media as well as books in order to be literate in the languages of uh, contemporary uh, society in order to participate, analyze, critique the society. However, Marshall McLuhan did not himself take the further step of developing a theory of media critique or of media literacy. And McLuhan focused on the form of the media and ignored uh, content. For McLuhan, the media, the medium is the message. And he didn't really analyze what the messages, values, ideology of media culture uh, was. That approach came to the, to the US from an earlier school of media theorists, which were the Frankfurt School, which just happened to be the school that probably influenced my own work more than um, any other. Um, I was um, getting involved in the study of media through McLuhan in the 1960s and the 70s, when the Frankfurt School was introduced uh, to the United States and uh, globally. As it turned out, um, after studying at philosophy at Columbia University in the 1960s, I got a German government fellowship to uh, go to uh, Tübingen, uh, Germany, to study philosophy with the great utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch in the late 1960s and early 70s. And at that time in Germany, they had what they called Raubdrucke, that were uh, pirate uh, editions of the uh, books of the original text of the Frankfurt School from uh, the 1930s, when they uh, had an institute in Frankfurt, Germany, that was the first uh, institute to study the media as the center of uh, culture, politics, and social life, that they were the first to develop a critical theory of the media and to develop an ideological critique of the media. The Frankfurt School were um, German Jews who uh, were, had in the Institute of Social Research in Frankfurt School in Frankfurt. Uh, they had a journal called Die Zeitschrift für Social Forschung. And um, I was very lucky in a Tübingen one night and I won about $100 in a poker game. So the next day I went to a bookstore and I bought um, a Raubdruck of the a pirate copy of the entire journal of the Zeitra for Social Forschung. So that's how I learned uh, critical theory from their journals and from uh, the uh, original text. Now it's true that Herbert Marcuse uh, had been in the United States um, from, uh, I guess, the 1940s uh, and stayed there, whereas Adorno, Horkheimer, and Pollock and others went back 
to uh, Frankfurt. So I had studied Marcuse in the 1960s. I was at Columbia University when they had the first great student uprising and occupation of the university uh, in the uh, uh, 1960s. So I was radicalized to study uh, critical theory. And of course, in Tübingen University, uh, there was also uh, the origin, one of the original sites of the new left, as well as um, uh, Frankfurt, et cetera. So, um, let's see. Okay. So, the Frankfurt School's key contribution to media theory was that the culture industry was at the center of culture and politics and society. They first experienced this in Nazi Germany, where Hitler and the Nazi parties controlled the uh, radio, took over the uh, film industry, newspapers, and controlled um, all of the um, uh, media. Um, Marshall McLuhan actually wrote a great chapter in understanding media on uh, the radio as a tribal drum and the way that Hitler used the radio and public address systems to um, provide a outlet for his speeches and his Nazi um, ideology that everyone in uh, Germany uh, listened to. There was also uh, German films like uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's The Triumph of the Will that uh, was one of the great German propaganda films that starts off with Wagner's uh, music playing and Hitler in a, a helicopter flying over Nuremberg, Germany, landing, being greeted by Nazis, going, having a march through the city where mothers held their children up to uh, their Fuhrer Hitler. Then he went to a big stadium and made a speech that was all recorded in this film. Interestingly enough, I saw Donald Trump do the same thing in 1960 when he started running for uh, president, where he had a big rally in Alabama where he flew in on his Trump uh, airline, landed, was greeted by people, uh, did a, 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 a motorcade into the city, went to a stadium with a mass audience and made the same kind of uh, racist and ultra-nationalist uh, extremist um, speeches like the Nazis. And I saw that we were in trouble in the uh, US. However, I didn't label Trump a fascist because Trump had no ideas. Uh, the Germans, Hitler and the Nazis had a very articulated ideology. Uh, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf that was a whole manifesto of exactly what his ideas were, what he was going to do that was horrible, but it bound together his followers. Where Trump never had an idea in his life, so he had no ideology. Um, and initially, he didn't have a mass base like the Nazis that Trump was basically a media celebrity that had fans who came to uh, uh, listen to him. Anyway, back to uh, the Frankfurt School. So um, after seeing Hitler and the Nazis take over uh, the media, the Frankfurt School, were because they were German Jews, were forced to immigrate to the United States where they came to uh, Columbia University that was my alma mater and set up their uh, Institute for Social Research. And they came to the conclusion uh, that the mass media in the United States was every bit as ideological as uh, the Nazi uh, use of the media. Um, Adorno uh, had a job with the Princeton Radio pr uh, Project. Uh, he and Paul Lazarsfeld and different colleagues were the first to do uh, critical communication uh, studies in the United uh, States. So Adorno studied how popular music conveyed the ideology of uh, bourgeois individualism, romance, the family, et cetera. 
And the Frogford School also saw how Hollywood film was an ideological apparatus. I had an interview with uh, Leo Lewenthal, who was the culture uh, expert, um, one of the culture experts uh, who wrote books on history of the mass uh, media. And I interviewed him in Berkeley where he uh, was a professor. And he told me that Horkheimer, Max Horkheimer, the head of the Institute, every day went to a film. You know, they were at Columbia University where there were maybe 10 movie theaters within walking distance of the university. And so every day, Horkheimer went either with Adorno or Marcuse or Lewenthal to the movies. And so that's how they wrote their culture industry book through a study of media culture. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 yes, of media culture and of the culture industry as an ideological apparatus. So their argument was that in every country, there was a culture industry that conveyed the dominant ideals and values and politics of a different uh, society, whether it was Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, where the uh, Communist Party controlled the media, uh, the US, where capitalist corporations controlled the media, or Britain, where the BBC was national uh, state-run culture apparatus that conveyed uh, British culture or French media or throughout the world. It was state uh, media that was uh, the center of uh, culture and um, ideology. Now, the Frankfurt School were the first to develop ideological critique and a critique of both the industry and the ideology and the content of um, the media. Um, but their focus was mainly on the dominant ideology. They came out of a Marxist tradition of ideology critique where ideology were the ideas of the ruling class. And they basically had to do with the ideas of the bourgeoisie of uh, capitalist corporations and conveyed uh, their um, ideology. So the third stage of um, media studies that was actually the introduction of what we now call cultural studies was British cultural studies, which in the 1960s formed a institute like the Frankfurt School to study and critique the media. And their focus was on British um, BBC and the British uh, cultural um, industry. And um, they expanded the concept of ideology to include gender, race, class, and sexuality. So they really began ideology critique in a broader uh, form. So the Frankfurt School mainly focused on the dominant ideology, class ideology, where British cultural studies that had feminists in the group. So they studied gender ideology. They had people of color like Stuart Hall, who was the head of uh, the British cultural studies, uh, who was um, an Afro-Caribbean, uh, I think from Jamaica, who um, migrated to uh, England and there were others also of color in uh, British cultural studies. So they studied uh, race. So cultural studies then uh, expanded to become a project that studied media culture in a very broad critical framework that involved the production of media, the study of media texts and ideology, audience reception. They introduced the notion of an active audience that we weren't just dupes of the media that uh, the, the Frankfurt School at their worst basically saw people as victims of ideological propaganda and brainwashing, which actually happened uh, in Nazi Germany to a 
startling extent. And to some extent in the US too, you could see how consumerism and capitalism, individualism, competition, the market, the dominant ideas in US society were uh, conveyed through the media. But the struggles weren't just over class and working class uh, struggles in the US, but starting in the 1960s, actually coming out of the 50s and earlier, there was a strong civil rights uh, movement. So uh, to this day, we had, had Black Lives Matter and Latino groups and Asian American groups. We have many different uh, movements uh, organized around uh, race. Uh, you had um, gay and lesbians organizing in the 1960s. So uh, ideology was expanded, not only by uh, British cultural studies, but uh, globally through all the political movements of the 1960s and the 70s that expanded the critique of uh, ideology. Now, British cultural studies was first introduced to me and many of my uh, generation at a conference on Marxism and the interpretation of culture held at the University of Illinois Urbana in July of 1983, which I attended, where Stuart Hall was the star of the show and the main influence on me and others. Um, Hall introduced British cultural studies to a wide uh, audience in uh, the US. And right after that, I went back to the University of Texas where I had started uh, doing a course on philosophy of culture and communication, uh, doing McLuhan and the uh, Frankfurt School. And I was also doing race, gender, and class, but it was British cultural studies that gave me the methodology uh, to do that. So uh, I and many others uh, began uh, teaching uh, cultural studies. And so uh, cultural studies uh, programs, or at least classes, uh, started um, being introduced in English departments. I was in a philosophy department, communication and media cult uh, um, departments were introducing cultural studies. But curiously, as I said earlier, before we started uh, the lecture and taping it, um, there hasn't been as extensive a development of uh, cultural studies programs in the United States as I had uh, hoped. It was uh, it mostly dispersed throughout the country in different programs at uh, different uh, universities. Now, at this time, I uh, came up with the idea of uh, media uh, literacy, uh, partly because uh, I was influenced by McLuhan, who made literacy a major part of uh, understanding media and the difference between book culture and media culture that required a uh, media literacy. And so I started uh, teaching uh, media literacy as part of cultural studies, learning how to analyze, critique uh, the media, but in particular to engage gender, race, and class. Uh, sexuality and the politics of uh, culture. In the introduction, it was uh, noted that uh, in my work, I talk about values and morality, uh, but also uh, the politics of interpretation and the politics of uh, media text that I think is an important part of uh, cultural uh, studies. And I had an opportunity to begin introducing uh, this form of political cultural studies uh, while I was still at the University of Texas, where I was first uh, given a government grant um, to teach uh, the teaching of cultural studies to teachers in the Mississippi Delta. The Mississippi River goes 
you know, from the north in the Great Lakes down to uh, the south and the Gulf of uh, Mexico. So uh, basically, I was given a grant to travel um, up and down the Mississippi to give workshops to uh, teachers in different states and to teach them how to teach uh, media uh, literacy. Um, when I got back to uh, Texas, the governor of Texas, Ann uh, Richards, um, this was in the uh, early 1990s, uh, recruited a group of uh, a Latino guy, an African-American uh, woman, a feminist, and myself to travel around Texas to teach Texas high school uh, teachers um, how to teach uh, media literacy. And so we naturally began doing uh, critical media literacy. So my initial appropriation of British cultural studies and the projects that I was involved in, I thought, of course, media literacy uh, is critical, that it engages gender, race, sexuality, ideo dominant ideology, and politics. However, the media literacy movement in the United States, such as a group in uh, Santa Monica that's still going, the, a center for media literacy, they taught media literacy without the politics. In other words, it was just sort of reading uh, the media, interpreting it, et cetera. Whereas I was stressing the politics of uh, representation. Now, the next stage of cultural studies that I experienced was, at, or cultural studies went global, was the Trajectories Conference, an international conference on cultural studies in uh, Taiwan in July of 1992, where, as I said, cultural studies went global with representatives from Asian countries, the US and uh, the United States, actually all, all the, many of the empire uh, countries of the former British empire, um, et cetera. And the stress there was to develop a national cultural studies that would become a global project drawing on British cultural studies, but doing a North American or a Taiwanese or an Indian or a German or French uh, cultural studies where you study the culture of the dominant society in the country in uh, which you um, uh, live. So this uh, led me to write, to publish in 1995, my book, Media Culture. That was a study of the dominant forms of North American culture at the uh, minute at the time. The films of Spike Lee, uh, Rambo, and the Top Gun and these sort of Reaganite uh, militarist uh, texts, uh, women's uh, uh, films, um, the films of African Americans, Latinos, all of the different uh, groups uh, and forms of media culture going from popular music to television to uh, film that uh, this is what I um, studied and described in um, my book, uh, Media uh, Culture. And here, drawing on media, uh, British cultural studies, I made the argument that cultural studies or culture is a contested terrain. So look at the US. Um, coming out of the 1960s, we had all these new social movements, civil rights, feminist movements, uh, gay and lesbian movements, anti-war uh, movements, et cetera. So basically we've had a contest in the United States over race, gender, sexuality, and between more progressive liberals and very right-wing and conservative regimes. So after the Kennedy um, regime, Kennedy administration 
in the 1960s of John F. Kennedy, who unfortunately was assassinated, but his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, was elected president on his own in uh, 1964. And Johnson um, instituted the Great Society, where a lot of the welfare programs, the civil rights legislation, uh, women's legislation and rights were uh, recognized. Um, they were sharply contested liberalism of the great society that was labeled as sort of socialist in their tradition of Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal. So for the next eight years, we had the Nixon administration, an extremely right-wing um, administration. Uh, Nixon, of course, got trouble uh, in this criminal um, conspiracy of the Watergate uh, scandal. So he was removed. Gerald Ford became president, who was defeated by Jimmy Carter. So we went back to the liberals, Democrats in the late 70s. Then you have the Reagan administration uh, in the 1980s, followed by George W. Bush, a conservative administration, uh, followed then by Clinton and the liberal administration, uh, followed um, or Clinton, uh, Bush, Bush uh, Jr., Shrub, George W. Bush, um, in the early uh, 2000s, uh, followed by Obama, eight years, and then Trump. So you see, we've gone from one pole to the other. So in our uh, political system, American politics has been a contested terrain between liberals and uh, conservatives. Um, from the 1960s to the present. But these same struggles, even more intense, took place over race, gender, sexuality. We continue to have battles in the present day over race. Black Lives Matter uh, reignited the civil rights uh, movement where African-Americans were getting shot by police to a scandalous degree. So you have uh, African-Americans organizing this movement, Black Lives Matter, some of the most dramatic demonstrations that I've seen since the 1960s uh, anti-war movement. The Latinos uh, have been an oppressed uh, group. Uh, of course, in the Trump era, there were struggles around immigration and uh, race. Uh, uh, the feminist movement has continued to be uh, very active. So you have a contested terrain between liberals and conservatives, racists, anti-racists, uh, feminists, anti-feminists, gay and lesbian movements, homophobics. And this has played out in media culture. So Hollywood film, television, had a tradition of basically celebrating white patriarchal middle class uh, values and portraying people of color, women, the working class in very negative uh, forms. But this started changing in the 1960s where you had first an independent film and video movement where young people people of color, Spike Lee and John Singleton and the filmmakers of uh, color, feminist filmmakers. Um, and so even in television and Hollywood film, we've had more critical uh, presentations of gender, race, class, sexuality versus more conservative. Now, of course, some television series, some films are contradictory. I'm not saying everything, you know, is straight up liberalism or conservatism, racism or non-racism, but this is the project for cultural studies and media critique is to analyze the politics of representation of films like uh, Rambo or, um, whatever the popular films, the popular music, uh, the popular TV shows are. Because 
media culture is not just a terrain of struggle over politics, but it constructs individual identities that men get their images from a Rambo or a Tom Cruise or on the more progressive rebellious side of Jack uh, Nicholson. Uh, women get their images uh, from traditional beauties like Elizabeth Taylor and Marilyn Monroe, or maybe more rebellious figures like uh, Jane Fonda or Vanessa uh, Redgrave and so on and so forth. So our images of gender, of sexuality, um, of uh, moral and immoral, good and bad uh, behavior, all comes, or not all of it comes, but is significantly shaped by the media. Of course, there's also family and church and religion and other forms of socialization. The media culture has become a major form of um, identity, of uh, behavior, et cetera. So this dramatizes the need for education and educators to create programs of critical media literacy that teach students and citizens how to read the media and how to see the politics of um, representation, um, et cetera. Um, I don't know if you know the most recent bo book that I published with Jeff Scher. We published a critical media literacy handbook where we taught or we laid out the project of teaching critical media literacy. And particularly Jeff Scher was a pioneer in teaching critical media literacy in the grade schools. I basically have been a university professor my entire life. So I taught first at um, University of Texas, Austin, and then I came to UCLA in 1995, where I've been ever since. And I was actually given a chair in the philosophy of education. So I've taught philosophy of education, but I also established a cultural studies uh, program. Uh, and Jeff has been teaching cultural studies in the teacher education uh, program. So we sort of partnered up and uh, did a book on a critical media literacy uh, handbook. And we've actually been doing a lot of uh, Zoom uh, presentations. We, a couple of days ago, were in uh, West uh, Germany. Uh, we've done uh, lectures uh, and conferences in uh, Canada, throughout the United States, Germany, uh, et cetera. We were talking before uh, the taping tonight about how Zoom has uh, globalized lectures and the teaching of uh, cultural studies and the tradition transmission of the ideas of uh, cultural studies, which of course the internet has also been very active in. There's websites and cultural studies. You can get a lot of uh, material um, online, um, et cetera. So I'm starting to lose my voice. So I'm gonna uh, wrap up now and give you all a chance to uh, ask uh, your questions. So I wanna conclude that critical media literacy involves first, seeing the media as a source of power in a contested terrain. We really have to see, as the Frankfurt School did, as British cultural studies, that the media are really a central form of power, of socialization, of ideology, of uh, politics, but it's a contested terrain where the struggles of the society are reproduced in the media. So it's important to be media uh, literate to uh, engage the politics of representation, which, include, which involves analysis and critique of media culture representing class, race, gender, and sexuality and other key constituents of 
identity involved in uh, social and political contestation and analyzing whether the text in question promotes racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, and other presentation, pre prejudicial forms of representation, or whether they present positive and even oppositional or emancipatory images, although many, as I said, representations and narratives of media culture are contradictory and uh, polysemic, multi-layered, eliciting contested interpretation of their politics of representation. Um, so in general, media culture in the 21st century is not a system of rigid ideological indoctrination like the Frankfurt School described that induces consent to existing capitalist, patriarchal, white dominant societies, but is increasingly pluralistic and enables an active audience to choose media texts and platforms, but requires a, sorry, a critical media literacy if one is to avoid uncritically appropriating dominant forms of film, television, popular music, and so on, and thus being seduced into racist, sexist, homophobic, classist, or other forms of uh, discriminatory ideologies. So media culture is highly political, requiring analysis of the politics of representation. And media critique uh, is should focus on media texts uh, as key elements of education and um, teach critical media literacy so our students and citizens our media become, can become media literate. Thank you and I welcome questions and discussions now. Uh, thank you, Professor Kellner. Before we begin the inter uh, interaction, uh, Professor Datta, Dr. Paraswani Datta, would you like to offer the vote of thanks or shall we do that at the end? I mean, let's start. Let's make it later. We will conclude with that. Fine, fine, fine. So I invite uh, uh, questions and comments uh, on uh, Professor Kellner's lecture. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Oh, good evening. Oh, good morning to you. Oh, <laughs> sorry, sir. Um, yes, uh, so, sir, uh, I had a, a question I wanted to ask you okay. uh, about what is your take on social on the role that social media has to play uh, regarding media literacy? Do you think it plays a positive or a negative role? For promoting media literacy? Probably both. This is a great question because this is the new terrain for studies of uh, cultural study and media literacy is to study internet culture and social uh, media. Now, I haven't been directly uh, involved in studying social media myself, but this definitely is very important. Uh, this is the task for your generation, because just as I was raised on film, television, rock and roll, and popular music, your generation has been involved uh, in social uh, media. I uh, use, you know, social media for teaching, and I, of course, do um, email for global communication, but I don't live, on, I don't, I'm not even on Facebook. Uh, so uh, that is definitely a area where uh, the next generation uh, needs to develop critical media literacy of uh, the problems, the limitations, the dangers of social media, but also how it can be used positively for uh, good use. So this is now a very important uh, project. And let me say this is a massively important 
political pro problem and issue in the United States with Donald Trump being elected coming out of you know, social uh, media, coming out of a celebrity uh, media uh, culture and being the first Twitter you know, president, uh, et cetera. Uh, so uh, that's the big issue now. I haven't and probably won't do it, but I'm hoping the younger generation will do the study from a critical standpoint of social media, but um, a critique of it, but also developing a critical, let's say digital uh, literacies in the multiple. Thank you for your question. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Hello. Uh, sir, I have a long question to ask you. Okay. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, so actually, my question is uh, cultural criticism, as it is practiced today, has uh, significantly complicated the older notions of culture tradition. Uh, sir, um, authors like Matthew Arnold uh, believed in culture as a force of harmony and social change. But, uh, so the cultural critics of the 20th century, uh, they sought to problematize such definitions. According to them, culture is a uh, uh, they describe culture not as a finished product, but uh, as a process that join knowledge to power. power. Uh, so they criticize the traditional canons. canons. Uh, so what is your opinion about this? My, my opinion is what I would call a critical dialectical mediation between traditional culture and high culture and uh, media. Uh, culture. Uh, I come out of book culture myself. Uh, I got my PhD in philosophy. I've written a lot of books in philosophy, social theory, politics, etc. So I am still committed to writing books, to teaching, to lecture, and I think there's still a great um, potential for uh, book culture, or let us say the form of writing that may take different forms in a digital um, age. Uh, but in fact, I would argue that uh, traditional literacy, book literacy, being able to read and write is more important than ever before today because we have to read more and we have to write more. And if we can't, if we're getting bombarded by media messages and we're slow or defective in reading, you know, we're not able to function in the uh, culture. If we're not able to write well, we're not able to participate in uh, uh, the culture. So literacies, traditional ones, reading and writing are more important than ever in the uh, you know new uh, culture. So I, I always like to stress this. So I love your question. I don't wanna uh, give the impression that we're now living in, in a new media age. And so media literacy uh, or in, in critical digital literacies is the task of education. It's all of these things with you know grounding in uh, traditional book culture and reading and writing. So thank you very much for your question. It's a very good one. Thank you so much, sir. Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, thank you for an insightful session. Uh, I would just like your comment on uh, how populism is becoming the new political approach and how social media is also becoming a uh, predominant space for messaging. Unfortunately, this is what elected Donald Trump, you know, populism and social media. Now, I come out of a tradition where populism was progressive. So it's scary and hard for me to get my mind around. And I, I, I've written on how social media can be progressive, that it gives voices to those that didn't have a voice when it first came out in the uh, 1990s. Uh, 
Um, I was, uh, I taught at the University of Texas in Austin, as I mentioned, from 1973 to 1995. And Texas had a great populist tradition. Now Texas is controlled by the right wing and conservatives and Republicans. But uh, previously, um, Texas uh, had this progressive populist uh, tradition, et cetera, and populism going back to the progressive movement of John Dewey in the early 20th century, the movements of the 1930s, Roosevelt and the movements um, you know, struggling during the depression. Uh, these were populist movements that were progressive. Moreover, uh, I was always in an alternative media tradition. I didn't expect to get on uh, television. You know, Noam Chomsky, our greatest media critic and maybe our greatest intellectual who's written, you know, tons of books on the media as well as me. He's never been on uh, network television, but he's on, you know, alternative television. So I started in 1978, a public access TV program called Alternative Views. And that uh, TV show um, was shown all over the United States on public access systems that sent the tapes we did. And these were tapes, three quarter inch tapes from one city uh, to another. And I was actually a media star in New York at one time in the 1980s and 90s because the TV show was shown on the CUNY, which is City University of New York, at a public access channel. And they played my show uh, seven uh, hours a day. It was called Alternative Views. And we had, you know, basically the most famous radicals in the country that came, you know, into the University of Texas to uh, lecture and we uh, interviewed uh, them as well as local representatives of um, African-American, Latino, feminist, gay and lesbian, environmental, anti-war, all the different progressive groups that were in Austin as well as um, Austin was very close to Central America. And at this time, there were the wars going on in Nicaragua, El Salvador. Um, so we had representatives from all these progressive movements all over the world that came into Austin that we uh, did interviews with and we showed documentaries that um, alternative media uh, people uh, made. So I, for many years, I was very you know, committed to social media and when I first, or to alternative media. Then when I came to Austin, I started a blog left. Um, so I was involved in that form of blogging for some years. But then there were so many blogs and so many people doing internet activism that I said, you know, I think I'm gonna go back to focusing my energy on teaching, writing books. And I was also starting to travel all over the world. So I stopped doing, you know, I never really got involved in social media. I left that, you know, to the younger uh, generations. But uh, again, it's been a very contested terrain that not only are progressives using this, but the most vile reactionaries, racist, sexist homophobes are also using it. So that's why media culture is a contested terrain. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Uh, so how did your idea of media literacy go from that to media spectacle? And ah. first is that. And the second is, how do you think that uh, this idea of media literacy varies from a first world country to a second or a third world country where media access itself is a huge question? Those are both very uh, good uh, questions. To the first question, I published Media Culture in 1995, but it basically studied American media 
from the late 1960s uh, up until the early 1990s for the most part, where film, television, popular music were the dominant forms of uh, media culture. Then in the mid 1990s, the internet exploded. So you have, you know, a completely uh, new media uh, uh, terrain. So now I see the project <laughs> of cultural studies taking the forms of developing critical media literacy and also a, a critical digital uh, literacies, et cetera. And this is um, a global project, as I indicated before. So um, I think in the third world countries, it's of vital importance. I told you about the Taiwan uh, conference trajectories in 1996. So there were people from all over uh, Asia and different uh, third world, uh, countries. And since then, there have been uh, cultural studies in many different um, countries during the world. And I saw, I was given a text message on screen from one of your participants that asked, how can uh, a university like your own do cultural studies? And you can teach cultural studies using the texts of British cultural studies, North American cultural studies, but you can also, I'm sure there is a developing uh, Indian cultural studies, and that is the project for you all to do. In fact, does, does, can someone uh, give me some um, idea of to what extent there have been Indian cultural studies? I know India has one of the great film movements in the uh, world. I know that your music is fantastic uh, and some of the most uh, popular and excellent um, uh, music globally. So to what extent is there an Indian cultural studies developing? I'd be very interested to hear. Can I come in for a second? Uh, there yeah. hasn't exactly been a convergent movement as such of cultural studies in India. And uh, the developments, whatever have happened, have been more recent. And right. uh, there has been no convergence. But there are a few things that we are trying to do. Say, for instance, a folklore has a place, say, for instance, in our scheme of things. And uh, folklore in the Indian context is, you know, still about living traditions. And... Uh, uh, it's part of popular culture. So that's where we are trying to, you know, that's one way we are trying to bring cultural studies home, as it right. were. And uh, apart from these, there are, you know, situation specific or region specific goals that we have. Say, for instance, there is a there is an association. We are from the northeast of India, uh, which is strategically very important. And for a long time, there has been a rhetoric of neglect that has been doing the rounds about, uh, you know, the, in the discourses of the people of the region, where people feel that they're aggrieved and they have been sort of left out of the mainstream culture and all that. Now, so there are very strong identity sentiments that have to be reflected. So even though cultural studies is not about studies of culture, we also do try to bring in some components of traditional studies of culture, because that could also help in assertion of identities and people really look forward to it. So yeah, thank you, thank you. But that's what I. Well, that, that's a great. That's a great uh, answer, and that strikes me as absolutely correct. Uh, that folklore uh, in many countries of the world is very important, and is actually the basis of a lot of your films and you know your music and. Uh, you know, other forms of uh, culture, dance, you know, ritual, et, et cetera. Um, so that, that is uh, excellent. But also you, your films, you have some of the great directors. So this would be uh, an interesting project to do cultural studies of, of actually the different forms of Indian music and uh, films that are, you know, globally. 
uh, popular. This is actually a, a concept uh, from British cultural studies that I made use of the global popular. And it's widely recognized that uh, certain forms of American culture, like, I don't know, the Rambo movies. I did a study of Rambo. And um, so <clears throat> I got examples from the internet of how both the Israeli government and the Palestinians that were fighting, you know, during a war at different times, appropriated iconography of Rambo. They had Rambo posters, you know, in their uh, homes that you saw. They wore Rambo headbands, uh, et cetera. So throughout the world, you saw this um, iconography, you know, of um, uh, Rambo, who became a globally popular figure, just like Madonna. Uh, you had Madonna wannabes in Japan, you know, uh, Taiwan, probably India, and, you know, different countries where young girls uh, basically appropriated Madonna as a uh, cultural icon. Maybe later Lady Gaga or, you know, Britney Spears or later uh, American, North American cultural um, um, icons. So you've had a, a global circulation, not only of theory, like British cultural studies circulating globally through the world, but also culture. Uh, obviously, British culture, Shakespeare, everyone in the English speaking world has read Shakespeare. There's Shakespeare films, you know, uh, throughout the English uh, speaking world, um, etc. So um, global popular also, you know, music, as I said, Indian music and films also have become globally uh, popular. So. Thank you, Professor Kellner. If you are not, I mean, if uh, if you have time, can we take two more questions at least? Sure, sure. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Professor Kellner. Good evening. I'm Bashabi. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, my apologies for switching off my video because it's a very bad network at my end. Okay. Uh, my first question to you is, uh, why do you uh, uh, choose to call cultural studies a project? Because the term project is a very overdetermined. You know, it has uh, a definite mandate, time bound, and also the question of spon sponsorship. Right. And uh, my second question is, uh, you know, the situation, uh, situatedness of the word global and the national in the title of your lecture. So uh, the global, when we are talking of media culture uh, uh, in a globalized context, it's an over, uh, you know, it completely overrides the national. So how uh, tenable is the national, uh, uh, the study of the national uh, in the context of a globalized culture with specific reference to cultural studies. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I would hope that global culture is not erasing national culture. I would hope that you can maintain your traditions in India of your folklore, of your uh, your music traditions, your film, your literary traditions, and uh, develop an Indian cultural studies that has a national basis. I would argue it's more important to focus on your national cultures. And that's true whether you're in Los Angeles or Northern India, that the, the primary focus, and that is British cultural studies, is a very localized and specific study of your own culture. So British cultural studies did not really study the culture industries like the Frankfurt School did. They didn't really study so much American popular culture. They studied the BBC. They studied uh, British working class uh, culture, British punk music, you know, reggae music, uh, etc. So I think the project, and I'll come to the project now, uh, of uh, cultural studies 
is a local one, is a national one, although it can draw on global traditions since cultural studies is now uh, global because, you know, all over the world, we know and we talk about uh, cultural studies. Uh, as for a uh, project, my first philosophical love was Jean-Paul Sartre. So for Sartre, the notion of project is very important. So everyone has an individual project. Your life is a project where you make these fundamental choices. So my project was being a philosopher. So I chose to study philosophy. Then I chose to study German philosophy. Um, I went to Germany. I get, well, I got a German government fellowship. Then I went a year uh, to France because my first philosophical love was existentialism, where I studied Sartre, Camus, so of course, and I love French film, and I just love Paris and you know French uh, culture. So, um, you know, I went to uh, France, um, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> so now we have a, a question on um, ideology. So anyway, that's how I got a uh, project that uh, every individual has their project. One of my projects became after philosophy, studying cultural study, studying Frankfurt School uh, social theory. So there was a question up. You want to repeat it or someone else? Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, good evening. So I wanted to ask about uh, the media's role on how it works when it tries to form a national culture, which could be dominant but it could also lead to cultural homogenization. So right. how it should work in a balancing way, uh, maybe in a nation with diverse cultural forms, practices and ideologies. Right, I, I would think that uh, culture is multi-layered and leveled between the local, uh, the national and the global. Both the United States and India are giant, giant countries. You know, we're two of the biggest and the most diverse in the world. So in the United States, although we have a homogenized mainstream culture of certain television, uh, radio, popular music, et cetera, we also have very diverse. The difference between Los Angeles, New York, and Nebraska or a Southern state is tremendous. So all of us are very determined. Um, everyone is now influenced by global culture because we lived in a global world. The most popular music, films, et cetera, are global. But there's also a strong national dimension, particularly to you know, major countries like the US, India you know, where you've had very strong, you know, national cultural traditions. And I think both the US and India have uh, local traditions. You mentioned that you uh, were from Northern India that has probably very different uh, culture than Bengali culture or Calcutta or, you know, different parts of uh, India have very different, you know, local um, cultures. So one Hello. last question. Okay. Sir, I had asked the question uh, regarding media ideology. Uh, I said that uh, according to the Marxist theory, we know that uh, dominant media ideology is the one that is that is uh, shared by the ruling group. So do you think this idea is uh, relevant even today or do you think the audience also plays a role in creating a media ideology? Both. There is a dominant ideology in the United States, which is the ideas of the ruling class, capitalism, the corporation, uh, the market, individualism, etc. So there's no question uh, 
that uh, the U.S. has and has had a dominant uh, ideology from the beginning. Uh, the initial ideology was expansionism, that the United States came from, well, the United States was formed by European immigrant um, population settlers who came from largely European countries, but later Asian, African, you know, from the whole world came uh, uh, to the U.S. So we've had, you know, dominant um, ideologies that are national ones, but we also have <clears throat> local ideologies like New York had a very urban uh, ideology, Boston, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, you know, uh, is the film industry, is California, you know, so, uh, so there's been sort of a California culture and um, ideology. And uh, as your question indicated, each audience uh, member has their own ideology. You have your own religion, your own political views, your own moral uh, values, your own media choices, et cetera. So um, ideology is again, very local, very personal, but also national and to some extent uh, global. So it's complex, contradictory, overdetermined and a very contested uh, field. So I, I guess uh, from the beginning of my work, I've been trying to, to develop more complex theories of ideology than say the Marxist theory of ideology. But I never deny certain teachings of the Marxist ideology. The ruling ideas are, uh, you know, some of the ideas of the ruling class, capitalism, you know, American nationalism. These are ruling ideas, you know, that are shared for the most part you know, by people throughout uh, the country, just like uh, India, I'm sure, has its uh, dominant ideas, its ruling ideologies, religions, et cetera. But it also may have more uh, local, you know, ideas and uh, ideologies. And there may be oppositional ideologies in both India and uh, the US. I know that India has a tradition of Marxism, just like the US did. Probably there's a feminist tradition, probably, you know, there's different ideological formations in big countries like the US and um, India. So thank everyone for their questions, your attention. And so I, I enjoyed talking to you with you. Doctor, uh, Doctor, can we have the yeah. vote of thanks? Yes, uh, thank you, Diversity. Uh, okay. Well, it's been an incredible Sunday morning for us, you know, yeah, engaging with the genealogy of Gulf studies and listening from the horse's mouth, you know, someone who actually lived through and experienced the last part of the cultural studies developments in different parts of the world. Thank you, Professor Kenna. It was a wonderful experience to listen to you. And we look forward to have, if possible, such kind of interactions more in future. Yeah. And I thank my colleague, Professor Debussy, first to, for planning it and arranging it this way. Thank you, students, my colleagues, the department from other departments, from other institutions as well. And lastly, I also thank my friends in the university administration for giving us the clearance and facilitating this event. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much also for inviting me. And I hope someday I can come to India. Please. I've never been to India and I would love someday to come. So I hope that day will arrive and we will have a future where we can talk face to face and have yes. some seminars as, as yes. well as lectures and discussions. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kevin. Okay. Thank you. And thank, uh, you. thank all the participants. Yeah, thank you. And I can say to you all, have a great day. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. As I hopefully you'll have a good night. Yeah, have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Good to see you all.